This is the third video in a series covering the theory behind x86 buffer overflows, how they work, and how they can be exploited. Last time, we exploited a buffer overflow vulnerability in a simple program to execute arbitrary code. However, that program was very simple and we had source code for it, making the task a lot easier. In this video, we'll start looking at building out a buffer overflow attack for a bit more complex program without doing a source code review to determine vulnerabilities. This starts with fuzzing. Fuzzing is common in various security testing scenarios and is the idea of sending lots of different payloads, including malformed requests, to see how they impact behavior on the target. This could be automatically generated payloads or could be working from a word list. We can bring this concept into the context of our buffer overflow to help us get started with developing our exploit. The main idea that we're working with here is to try and understand what payload is required to overflow the buffer, including being large enough to actually overflow the allocated buffer space, as well as being formed in a way that bypasses or satisfies any input validation. Let's take a quick look at the target to see what we're trying to interact with. We're going to be using an application called Vaughn Server. This is a Windows-based TCP server application built to include some vulnerabilities for security researchers to practice and develop skills. We've downloaded the executable and accompanying DLL onto a Windows machine here. Let's start up Vuln Server by double-clicking it. Based on the Vuln Server documentation, it listens on port 9999 by default. Let's bring up our Kali machine and use Netcat to connect to the service. Netcat is a super useful tool for interacting with TCP and UDP services. We're using the N switch to disable any DNS lookups and the V switch to increase the verbosity. We're then specifying the IP address and port of the target service. Great, we can see the banner for Vaughn server. Let's type help as prompted to see what commands are available. We've been provided with a list of commands that we can run here. Looking at the tron command, we can see that it requires tron a space and then the argument. Running trunk with a random string and we get a trunk complete response. The following methods can be scaled to test multiple commands but for now we're just going to focus on trun. To determine if a trun command is vulnerable we'll use part of the fuzzing tool creation suite called spike which is pre-installed in Kali. In particular we'll use generic send TCP. This tool will fuzz a TCP target with automatically generated payloads, including various characters that may be required for bypassing or satisfying any input validation. Checking the command usage, we can see that there are a few arguments required. First, we've got the target's host and port. Next, we can see that a spike script is required. Let's take a look at the spike script that we'll use. This is a very straightforward example, but the tool can support quite complex scripts to generate the payload. At the top here, we're specifying that we want to run a read line from the server as it sends a welcome banner when we connect. Next, we use s underscore string to specify a string that will be static across payloads. We always want to start our requests here with trun followed by a space. If we were targeting an HTTP server, for example, this would likely include the request type, resource, and version. Below this, we specify a string variable. This is where the tool is going to enter an automatically generated payload. The X string that we've included here is just the first value that it will try, as well as the value that it will provide when iterating through any other variables if present. As we've just got the one string variable, this default is fairly irrelevant. So this script will read from the TCP connection, then send trun with our generated payload appended, before moving on to the next payload and repeating. Heading back to the command, there are two arguments left, skip var and skip string. Skip var is relevant if we have multiple variables defined in our script and allows us to skip fuzzing a certain variable. Skip string will allow us to start a variable's fuzzing from a certain point within the payload generation process. This will allow us to easily resume fuzzing from a certain point if needed, but for now, we can just set them both to zero. So that leaves us with our command with the host, port, script, and zero for the skip arguments. Let's run this against Vaughn server to see if it crashes. Great, it's crashed almost immediately. So we know that this application doesn't handle certain payloads well. We need to find out what the payload that caused the crash is. 
There's a couple approaches for this. Let's add a five second sleep into our spike script to give the server a bit of time to process the request before we send another. We also need to see which requests are being sent, which we can use ngrep for. We'll need to run this as sudo. Then we'll specify the interface that we'll listen on with the dflag. We'll use q so it only prints the packet data. You'll notice empty quotes here. That's for the positional parameter for a string to grep for, which we don't need, but the parameter needs to be there nonetheless. And finally, we're restricting down to packets sent to the target. ngrep automatically filters out packets that don't contain any data. Let's start ngrep, and then start up Vaughn server again before beginning the fuzzing. We can see Vaughn server has crashed. Let's head back to ngrep to see what's been captured. We can see Tran X has been sent first as expected. After this, we can see Tran forward slash full stop colon forward slash followed by a long string of A's. You'll notice that the next packet doesn't start with Tran. This is due to the maximum transmission units or MTUs, meaning that we can only send 1460 bytes of data per packet, meaning our payload is split over a few packets. In total, we've got 1460 times 3 plus 6 or 700, so roughly 5000 A's. We can see that this is the final payload. Depending on whether a sufficient timeout was set in the spike script, you may see some other requests that were sent following the one causing the crash. Now that we've got a payload that should crash the server, let's load up Vaughn server in the debugger so we can get visibility into the registers and memory stack. As we're in Windows, we've got a couple of choices of debuggers, such as Oli Debug or Immunity. If we are running on Linux, we could use EDB or GDB. And for Mac OS, we could use LLDB, which is the default debugger for Xcode. We could even run the Windows application on Linux under Wine and use one of the debuggers available there. But the concepts here are applicable across all of these platforms, assuming the architecture is x86. For now, we'll use Immunity. Now bear in mind the debugger needs to be running in the same scope as the target application. For example, if the target application is running as administrator, then our debugger needs to be running as administrator as well. Within Immunity, there are two ways that we can connect to our target application, either by selecting open here or attach to attach to an already running process. As our process isn't running yet, we'll select open here, select our executable. There are a few things going on in the screen here. At the top left, we've got the assembly code for the program, highlighting where we currently are. At the top right, we've got the CPU registers. At the bottom left, We've got a memory dump view in hex and ASCII, and at the bottom right, we've got a view of the memory stack also in hex and ASCII. You'll notice that the bottom right status indicates that the program is paused. It's automatically paused at entry point within this debugger. Let's resume it so we can interact with Vaughn server. You can either click the play button here or press F9 to run. Let's validate that our determined payload crashes the server by generating the string of Python, being trun forward slash full stop colon forward slash and 5000 days and then we'll pipe that into netcat send it to the target awesome something's happened here looking at the bottom in immunity we can see there was an access violation when executing 41 41 41 41 great this lines up with what was happening in our previous buffer overflow videos taking a look at the registers we can see that the EIP and EBP contain 41, 41, 41, 41, which is hex for AAAA. Reviewing the stack below, we can see that it appears to be completely filled with A's. So what's presumably happened here is our input string has been copied to a variable, but it's exceeded the allocated buffer space, and so has overflowed and overwritten the stored EBP and return address. And so when the function ends, these are written to the EBP and EIP accordingly, the latter of which has caused our access violation or segmentation fault, as 41, 41, 41, 41 is not a valid accessible memory address. 
through a bit of trial and error of seeing what's required to cause the crash, we can determine that it's just the full stop followed by a long string of A's. Great, we now know that sending tron, space, full stop and a long string of A's will crash the application. But we want to be able to do more than that. This generated payload was the first sent by generic send TCP, so there's a high chance that it isn't exactly 5000 bytes required to overflow the buffer and overwrite the return address. We need to get a general idea of how long this string actually needs to be in order to crash the target. Let's use a simple fuzzing script now to help us identify the buffer overflow. This will send a payload with our prefix of tron, space, full stop, and an increasing number of A's. Working our way through this code, this has been written in Python 3 as indicated at the top, could easily be written in plenty of other languages. And we just import a couple of modules here, socket to support our TCP connection, sys for our application exit, and sleep so that we can add a pause between each of our payload sends. Then we've got the port and the host of the target. Below this, we specify the command prefix of tron space full stop that we've confirmed is needed. Next, we specify the character that we're going to fuss with, being the letter A. We'll specify a starting fuss length of 1500 bytes and a fuss step of 100, meaning that we'll add an additional 100 A's each time. Next, we'll enter our while true and try statements. This just means that the next section will loop until an error is thrown. We specify our socket object to use to facilitate the network connection with AFINet specifying IPv4 address family and Sockstream specifying that this is a TCP connection. Next, we'll set a timeout of two seconds so that our script will actually exit if the server is unresponsive. And next, we connect to our target with our previously specified IP and port. We then need to receive some bytes for the welcome banner and then we can build our payload consisting of the prefix, plus A times our fast length, which starts at 1,500. We'll print a message here, just so we know what stage of the fuzzing we're at, before sending the payloads. Once the payload's sent, we need to receive some bytes being the response that we get when the trunk command is run. We'll sleep for a second, and then we'll increase our specified fast length by our first step, which is 100 bytes. And then we'll loop back, as we're still within our while true statement, as we haven't hit an error yet. When this runs, this time, first length is now 1,600 bytes. This process repeats until an error is thrown, at which point we'll be taken to our accept statement, which will print the current fuzz length before exiting the script. We expect the error to be thrown either when reconnecting to the host, or when receiving the response after sending the payload causing the crash. Let's restart Immunity and Vuln server. We can either press Ctrl in F2 or click here, or here. Once that's running again, press F9 so Vault Server is running. And let's run our new fuzzing script. We can see it incrementing its payload by 100 bytes until it ends at 2100. In Immunity, we can see that we've successfully overwritten the return address which has been written into the EIP, overwriting it with 41, 41, 41, 41, causing an access violation. Let's quickly validate this by restarting Immunity and Vuln Server, and then using Python to send a payload of 2000 bytes. And we can see that this doesn't crash, and we'll send it again with our payload being 2100 bytes. and we can see that Vuln server does indeed crash. So we know we need to send a payload consisting of tron, full stop, and roughly 2100 additional bytes to overwrite the return address and crash the application. In this video, we covered some methods to fuzz a target to confirm whether it is vulnerable and to build a general idea of what's required to exploit that vulnerability. Next video, we'll look at a method to determine exactly how many characters are required to overwrite the return address so that we can control the value that gets written to EIP and therefore control the flow of execution. Thanks for watching.